there is homework, which we were just discussing. Homework number two is due on Wednesday. I suggest you don't wait around, but, but dive into it. The homework is to compute the Hamming weight of a string. It's a number of symbols that are distinct from the zero symbol. Uh, it's a complicated way, in this case, of saying count the number of ones in the binary representation of the number. So, so here it is, and we've, we've, we're assigning a value, representing it in hex. The value goes into this integer value, in, value, right? And you notice that what I do down here in the C code is I set the weight to zero. And how do I figure out when there's a one or a zero? Well, that's easy. I just walk through uh, 32 times because the, I know that an int is four bytes, which is 32 bits. And, and so I'm going to walk through uh, 32 times, right? This is, a, this is a for loop, which sets i equal to zero and then runs up until i is 31, incrementing each time, and then terminates. And so I add to the weight whether the uh, next bit is a, a zero or a one. And the way I do that is I take the value, whatever it is right now, so initially it's this, and I bitwise and it with a one. So that masks off this low bit here. In this case, I would get zero because zero and one is zero. And then I shift it, right? This is a bit shift operation in C. This is value gets value shifted by one place. So that drops off. This is now the low bit. So the next time through the loop, I do a bitwise and of one and one. Well, that's one. And so I add one to the weight. Previous loop, I added zero to the weight. I had one to the weight and shift it again. And I keep doing that 32 times to count up the number of ones that would be in the binary representation of this number. Okay. And, and I should get 16. And you can put this code in and run it and, and, and see how that works. <clears throat> so this is C code that, that does the task that we're talking about. But we don't want C code, that's, that's boring. We want assembly. And I gave you an assembly framework to sort of get you started. And I, I do want this to be in there, this, this line right here, this percent define, uh, because my checking code is gonna look for it. So we need to start somewhere we are going to come in. If we were using the C runtime, that would be main. Here we're not, so it's underscore start. So we have to declare that global so that it's externally visible. So it becomes a public thing. And then we have a text section, which contains the program. And we'll talk about sections today. So you'll know what that's all about. We define our input value. We're going to use it down here. This is just a macro. So once the assembler runs, it it looks for anywhere there's input or places it with this value. Just think of it as pound define in from C. Here's our start. We take our input value. We put it in RAX. And our RAX is holding our uh, value. We then do whatever code needs to be done to compute the Hamming weight for the number in RAX. We make sure the result winds up in the register RDI. Why is that? We'll talk about system calls today, but basically our syscall is going to return the value that's in RDI. The syscall 60 is exit. We'll call that and that will exit with the return value or the exit value uh, back to the command line. So that's, that's the framework. You just need to fill in this little piece right here and uh, you should be in good shape. There's a, there's a myriad different ways to do this. Uh, just tons of them. There are some, some cute, cutesy tricks you can use. Uh, there are some direct, simple, obvious ways you can use. It doesn't matter to me which way you use. Uh, take a look at the previous program we did. Walk through it. Be sure you understand it. And I think you can do this. This, is a, this should be a simpler problem than having to figure this stuff out and multiply by three and all that other good stuff. When you have questions about this, please email me and, uh, and I'll pick up my email and, and try to help you out. Uh, but that's pretty much it. If you understand the C code and how that works, hopefully you'll understand how to make the assembly work. All right, let's talk about tools. So a really useful tool 
would be a debugger because assembly can be really annoying and, and opaque. And the one we're going to talk about today is the GNU debugger, GDB. And you may have used this to debug your C code. And if so, that's great. A lot of the same stuff is going to work uh, for assembly that worked for C. That's one of the nice things about GDB. It also runs on a lot of different platforms. So I can debug my ARM code with this, my Intel code with this, my AVR code with this. That's great. Uh, it can debug you know, full up operating systems and it can debug stuff that's, that's basically running on bare metal. It's, it's, it's really versatile uh, and pretty neat. And if you really get into it, you can build it in, in a lot of different ways so that it can, for example, talk to a backend on another computer so you can debug something on a machine that doesn't have a connected display. So there's lots of stuff you can do with it. Uh, every year I think about whether or not I want to do GDB or something else. There are some Windows only ones <clears throat> that are pretty good. Let's do them here. There are some that run on multiple platforms that are open source ones that are really good. Uh, probably Ryzen is the closest candidate in my mind to replace GDB. And I think about it and ponder it, uh, but GDB has is, is, is gotten really powerful. And they've added a bunch of stuff to it that, that I think still keeps it a little bit ahead. Ryzen's close behind in my mind. Ryzen has a lot of cryptic commands. GDB does too, but, but Ryzen's are sort of especially cryptic, I think. <clears throat> so that may be another one you want to consider, but I think GDB is, is pretty solid. And it's going to be on most platforms that you find. Ryzen's not going to be. Lots of stuff you can do with GDB. You can single step, you can set breakpoints, you can look at, at, at data and memory and registers, and that's all neat stuff. We'll cover these last three in future uh, tools sections. Something called the data display debugger, Jeff, and, uh, and then modifying uh, all kinds of stuff in your program. Okay. And, and in fact, in a later class, we'll talk about how GDB is able to do the things that it does because it does some things that break the security of the system and that's by design. And if there's a way to break the security of the system by design, you can just drop those last two words and say, break the security of the system and that's sufficient and that's gonna be fun. So we can, we'll talk about that later on. Lots of documentation. Uh, GDB is unbelievably feature rich. Uh, we will not even come close to covering all the things that it can do, uh, but you can read the documentation and and then there's also help in the shell itself through the help command. So uh, let's walk through using GDB and instead of going through slides because slides are boring, uh, let's go down here and uh, have a look at a little program and do some stuff with it. So here's my little binary.asm program. It's available uh, along with the slides for this class on, on iLearn. <clears throat> if you want to walk through it, I tried to add comments to hopefully make it make some sense. So I've got a little make line at the top to build it. And uh, this one does get started from C. So you see that it's got a main and it's built with GCC and it's built statically. And we'll talk about how to build dynamically at a later class. So it starts from main, we put a nasty looking value in RDI. We then write out that value, write an end of line, return zero. So that's our main function. And so we're gonna call this write binary keyword. That's this guy down here. It prints the number in RDI as a 64 bit binary number. There is no significant return value. It's basically void. Uh, I used to put C style function prototypes in front of these things until a student told me they didn't understand C style function prototypes. And so I started just writing words, live and learn. <clears throat> so uh, in here we do the usual stuff and uh, we'll do some more assembly stuff today. But if you want to take a look at this, you can it's mainly comments, uh, but lots of code to do printing out the binary digits in a, I think an interesting way. And there's a little lookup table at the end so you can see how that stuff works. So it's, it's probably worth taking a look at this. <clears throat> it's got some funny assembly tricks in it. Like here, there's a shift right, and then we do a lookup. 
down here instead of doing a shift, we just do a multiplication. So there's just there's just stuff going on in here that might be, and and some of this won't be familiar to you immediately today. Most of this you're probably already could look at. Calls may be new. This memory stuff is new, but we'll cover some of that today. All right. So with that out of the way, we can make it, and we can run it, and we run it. If we assume, assume we type it correctly, we print out that first number we had as binary. And so this looks like f, f, 0, 0, f, 0, what is that, 4, 3, 2, 1, that's cute, 0, 0, 9, 9, uh, uh, a, a. So that's what it printed out. Is that, in fact, what the number was? Let's see. f, f, 0, 0, f, 0, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 0, 9, 9, a, a. It looks right to me. Looks like it it works. <clears throat> so there's a couple different ways to start GDB. Simplest is just to type GDB, and we're in GDB. Uh, if you did it without a file, you can say file and the binary file you want to read, and it'll load that in. If you don't want to go through all that, you can just start GDB straight up with it, and it'll go ahead and read the file. So. Now we have the file binary in here. And it knows about some stuff. It knows about symbols in the program. Uh, it knows about main. Uh, it knows about various uh, 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 symbols and, and functions because it's done some initial analysis. And that's pretty helpful. We can print the value of an expression with print. So if I did help P, print, uh, it tells you a lot about uh, print, you can see that there's options, there's uh, a format stuff you can use, and you can print an, ex an expression. We can, it's got a very simple pager, you just hit return to go to the next one. Lots of information about it. But basically, uh, for example, P main, that will just print whatever main is. And, and right now, main is the start of our program. This is the address where it's found. And it puts this thing in front of it uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later on. It tells you basically what's there. You can do some math with it. So P main plus 20. It prints out main plus uh, 20. Is that right? This says 30. It says 44. The difference is hex 14. That would be 16 plus 4, which is 20. So yep, that's 20 more. Uh, just expressed as a hex number. All right, and you see the stuff in front of it has changed a, a tiny bit, but, but not too much. We'll talk about the difference in those a little bit later on. All right, other things I can do, I can use C like casts. So I can cast main to an int and print it out. There it is as an int. Look at that. That's the integer value of that. Doesn't look the same 420.1520 as opposed to 41C30. Uh, I can do things like take a look at the uh, content of it. So let's go ahead and cast main to a char pointer and dereference it and print the result. And we find out that the first uh, byte of main is the value 72, and it looks like an H. I don't care doesn't matter what it looks like. It's, it's going to be part of the SQL code, so who cares? Another way to do the same thing is that. That does the same thing. That says, treat main as if, the con as if this is an address that points to a character and tell me what that character is. And I could have done int, or I could have done long and, and done that as well. Just some, some basic, simple stuff. You can, you can print, and you can use C like casts, and you can abbreviate print to just P. Fairly simple. Another command that's really, really, really useful is X. Uh, X is the examine memory command. Seems like that's what we've been doing with print up here and the casting and dereferencing. But let's actually be more legit and say, what's it mean? So, 
GDB says, okay, what's it Maine? There's the address of Maine. It's got a label associated with it, which is Maine. And there's some stuff there. That's what it shows there right now. Okay. Uh, I can add some little stuff after this. I put a slash. I can give it a number to repeat. I can give it a format and a size. So I might say uh, X for hexadecimal and B for byte. So this would print, uh, six, and I could, the order doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter. So I could say 16 bytes printed in hexadecimal, starting at main. And there you go. And so these are the first uh, 16, there's eight, there's eight more. First 16 bytes of our main uh, function right here. Up here, we said the first one was 72. Down here we say it's 48. Do those match? Well, four times 16 is 64, plus eight is in fact 72. So a little bit of uh, complicated hex math for you there. When I just had it display the result, it displayed a double word result, right? Four bytes. And it said 99 AABF48. And this is the, the correct result if I take these four bytes right here and I treat them as little Indian. And we'll cover Indianness later in this lecture. So 99 is here, AA is here, BF is here, and 48 is here. Basically, the little end of the number, the little the byte on the lowest order byte, comes first. And we work up to the highest byte, which is up here. All right. Have more of that later on. Lots of different ways to print things. I could print them as unsigned decimal numbers, or I could print them as signed decimal numbers. And I could go ahead and say, instead of bytes, I want, uh, let's do words, right? So a byte is a single byte, obviously. A word is two bytes, right? We know that a word is two bytes, a double word is four bytes, and a quad word is eight. So let's go ahead and print words, and let's print them in hexadecimal, 16 hexadecimal words. Seems straightforward, let's just do that. And what we get is not words. We get one, two, three, four bytes each time. We get double words. What? What's going on here? Well, GDB has its own way of looking at the world. And it doesn't use, it uses byte. It doesn't use words to mean the same thing that we're gonna mean everywhere else. It doesn't use double word. What it uses is half word. So a half word is what we would think of as a word. A word is what we would think of as a double word. And instead of a quad word, it has G for giant. And, and there's your giant. It's, I don't know why it's there this way. It may just be there to be confusing. Who knows? Uh, it does avoid a conflict with D for double word and D for decimal, but I don't think that's why they did it. Who knows why they did it? Anyway, different ways of, of looking at it. Uh, but let's go back to the very first one, 16 hexadecimal bytes. A lot of the commands in GDB, if you just hit enter, it'll run the command again in what it thinks is the most logical way. So you see here, I saw the first 16, hitting enter showed me the next 16 and the next 16, and it preserves the information from before. So if I just did uh, four, let's say, it would then show me them four at a time. So that's another way to do it. A really useful result for this is to use I. So I says, go and display the instruction decode this as if it were an instruction and show me what it is. And you see, that's in fact what it did. This was a little, little shorthand for disassembly. Uh, so go and look at memory at location main, figure out what's there and just and decode it as if it were an instruction. And that's what we get. Uh, and again, hitting return just walks you forward and we keep going. So that lets you display what's in there. There's a list of the common stuff in the slides. Sorry about that. I got to turn that 
down to let me know that my daughter's blood sugar is too high. <clears throat> so I can put expressions in here. So I could say main plus 20. It'll display what's, what's there. I could uh, uh, do, a, do a bunch of that kind of, do a bunch of that kind of stuff. So, and I can, of course, put a number in front of this and display the 16 instructions starting at that location. And there they are. This turns out to be a really useful thing to do. We'll see why later on. All right. Uh, so some of these modifiers also work with print. So remember we had, uh, I wanted to print the integer stored at main and it gave me that. How about if I use slash X, it would show it to me in hexadecimal. What if I just wanted uh, the first and last byte of this? I could do this. And sure enough, uh, it will let me print the value of an expression. In this case, expression involves dereferencing part of memory and then doing a bitwise and with a mask. So it's pretty versatile in terms of the expressions that it understands. <clears throat> and that can be really useful when you're looking at assembly and you're wondering why something didn't work. You can try it out, print the result, be sure you've got the, the stuff working correctly. So I can look at registers, but it's not going to work right now. Let's try it. So print and use a dollar sign to look at registers. I don't know why you just do. So if I say dollar RIP, that's the instruction pointer. I want to print out its value. It will say no registers. That's because my program isn't running right now. I haven't started it. So let's start it. The way that you run a program is just by saying run. If I do that, it runs it. And you see it ran. There's the output. And it exited normally. And that's it. OK, that didn't help me much. If you remember, if you've ever done this for C, you know that you would use start to start the program and immediately halt in the main function. Well, we don't want to do that. We want to stop at the first instruction. And so to do that, we add an I on the end. This will start the program and halt before executing the first instruction. And so there we go. And we see, remember our program has a main, but we see that it has stopped in something called start. I'm just going to start. We didn't create that. That we got as part of the C runtime. There's, there's almost always a start there, which is where Linux wants to start things. Uh, in this case, that was provided by the C runtime for our little program. And now we're running, we can print RIP. And this is what RIP is right now. It tells us it's a, it's a function, it, it points here, that's its value. And I can do stuff like um, print it in hex, uh, print it in decimal, play games like that. I could go get the first byte uh, at that location. And, and, and just stuff like that. So all the same things will work. Uh, $RIP is just a way for me to get the, the value of the instruction pointer. Uh, for example, I can take a look at what the instruction is at that location by saying examine memory with I, so decoded is an instruction, and giving it RIP. And it tells me, here it is. This is the value at that location. If I just hit enter, it shows me more and more of the of the start function. All right. But the little arrow, the little arrow here, that shows me that this is where RIP points. RIP is not changed as I walk through this. It's just showing me what's in memory. Uh, I can say info registers, and it will show me a bunch of information about registers. There are the the uh, the usual registers. There's the base and stack pointers, which we'll talk about more as class goes on. Here's the new registers that get added. Here's the flags register, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Here are the segment registers, which we'll talk about in the future. And there you have it. There's our, our list of registers, at least the ones that it chose to print. You can abbreviate that. You can abbreviate info as I. So I could say IR, and there you go.
that's another way to look at what's on there. E flags is the set of flags in the 32-bit world. There are some cross-platform things. Uh, the program counter, and it's just the PC is just another name for the program counter, which on the XA6 platform is called RIP. It's a way to get it in a way that's not platform specific. Same thing with the stack pointer. There's the stack pointer, and there's the stack pointer. Uh, and there are a couple of others. I'm trying to think. Uh, the processor status gives you the same thing as the processor flags. It's just another name for it. And there is a frame pointer as well, which kind of makes sense here, but not 100%. Um, it makes more sense in a world in which there's an explicit frame pointer like ARM. All right, so is our program running? I think it is. Where? We'll tell you what's, try to interpret what's on the stack. So it looks like we're in start. Uh, we got there by doing start I. So let's do it again. Yes, we'll restart the program. And now uh, the program is running and we've stopped at the first instruction. We can disassemble with the disassemble command. We can give it a location to disassemble like main and it disassembles the function at main it tries to do the whole function we can give it nothing and it tries to disassemble the current function that we're in which happens to be start so it disassembles the start function there it is if i give it an address like say this and i say and i can abbreviate it to that and I say, disassemble that address, it gives me the same thing. It's always gonna try to disassemble the current function that, I, that, it, that this is in, that RIP is in or that the argument is in. And so this is down here, but it gave me this whole function. If I really just wanted part of it, then I could get that by saying disassemble, let's say here, comma, I don't know, here. And I just get that, it's a, a subset of it. That's one way to do that. If I wanted to see the bytes that make up instructions, slash r for raw bytes, and there they are. And it's not formatted beautifully, but they're there. So we can see them here. Um, and here are the bytes that make up main. See that 99 AA BF 48 we saw earlier? There it is. So we can look at stuff in a variety of, of different ways uh, using disassembly. Now, all the stuff I'm looking at happens to be in the Intel dialect. And if you try this right away, you may find that things are not. Uh, set this assembly flavor ATT. Do that again. And sure enough, there's the AT&T style. Why am I getting the Intel style by default? And you might not be. Well, the answer is I have a .gdb init file where I do this command. You can put commands for GDB to execute uh, right in here and they'll be run whenever you start GDB. So when I start GDB, I get the nice, uh, what I think is the nice Intel format. All the stuff from Kevin, by the way, is, is in, the, in the lecture notes. I just think it's more interesting to see it interactive. All right. So without anything, it shows you the function where uh, your instruction pointer is. Let's single step through this. And if you've used GDB before, you know that step moves forward one line of your C program or whatever. Next moves forward a line and passes over uh, function calls. Well, the same thing is true here, except we don't use those. We use next I, 
and step I. So, and that says do the next, do the, take one instruction forward, take one instruction forward, but step over calls. So we're going to use uh, step SI, and we take a step, and let's take another step, and another step. And so we stepped, and then we took two more steps. So we should be here. Let's see where we are. Sure enough, that's where we are. See, that's what the little guy is pointing to our instruction pointer. If we really want to know for sure, we can print RIP, or we can XI RIP and see that we're exactly where we thought we should be. So there we go. We're pointing right here. We're about to, about to pop a value into RSI. Let's take a look at RSI. That's what it is right now. Let's take a step and let's print RSI again. And it's got the value of one in it. It changed. That's good. Went from zero to one. So when we popped, we got a one in. That's, that's fine. Um, what else to talk about here? Not a whole lot. Uh, Okay, so now we're pointing to a call. And I can step into the call with SI, or I can step over it with NI. Let's do NI. And uh, that takes us to something libc start main. Now, you notice it didn't step over this call, it stepped into it. Why is that? Well, that's just a symptom of the way that the GCC or GDB tries to be helpful. We'll talk about this little guy later on. You don't want to execute this little guy. And so it can't step into this because it, if it returned, it would execute this or step over this because it would execute this. It has to step into that. And that's in fact what it does. We'll talk about why later on. So let's go ahead and introduce something fun. Continue. Continue. We'll just finish the program. And there it goes. And it exits normally. So wherever you are, comp, we'll just uh, need to read it to see your comp. We'll just continue the program. Let's set a breakpoint. We care about main. That's where our code starts. So let's set a breakpoint at main. And you do that with B. And you give it, in this case, we give it main. And that sets it there. This can be any expression that specifies an address. So if I wanted to stop here. I could do that. Uh, it's going to argue and say, I don't know what you're talking about. We'll say yes. Info on breakpoints tells us the two breakpoints that we have. Let's start our program. And let's run. And uh, we hit the breakpoint, and there we are. So we hit this breakpoint one time. It knows about it, and life is good. Uh, we can set them in different ways. Before I start doing that, just automatically typing that, let me uh, say this. We want to stop here. If I try that, it complains again. Why is it complaining about these? It's complaining about these because it doesn't understand this expression correctly as an address. And the solution is a bit obscure, but if I just tell you the answer, uh, you can just put it in your brain and remember it, and life will be good. Put a little star in front of it, and there you go. And you notice that that's what it did. It put a breakpoint in there, and there's our breakpoint. And it still has this bad breakpoint here, which we don't want, and this in which we don't want. How do we get rid of these? We use D. We just delete them by number, and they're gone. So let's go ahead and correctly type start i. And uh, we can continue our program. And look, it hit breakpoint four in start, just like we wanted it to. Isn't that great? Disassemble will show us the function that we're in. There we are. We're at our breakpoint. That's great. If I say continue, we hit the next breakpoint. And there's our main function where we wanted it to be. Nice, nice, nice stuff. Uh, you can disable breakpoints. So here are breakpoints again, info breakpoints. And I can say, let's disable one. 
And you see this time when I do it, it says it's not enabled. So let's run the program again. And you see uh, we hit breakpoint four, which is right here. It's enabled. And when I continue, the process exits. We don't break at main because I've disabled it. I can clear a breakpoint. Uh, let's run it again. I hit the breakpoint there. Uh, clear isn't going to want to work for you because it doesn't have a source file that it can reference. So I have to be more specific and give it a location. And now I clear the breakpoint at main. And sure enough, there we go, it's gone. And I can delete the last one. So breakpoints are pretty neat. You can do other stuff with them. Um, our main function calls this guy. Whoops, <laughs> that's not copy, there we go, copy. Calls that guy, which has a loop in it. Let's go ahead and disassemble that. And it doesn't get us all the way to return. And that's because uh, the way in which GDB works confuses it a little bit here, right? Because what we're actually doing is we hit the next symbol, which happens to be top. I think it's top. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I thought it was top. Uh, And yeah, it's top. I don't know where I was. Maybe I, just, maybe I just typed it wrong. Let's just copy it and paste it. Let's see if I can get it that way. Eh, I didn't want to do it for some reason. Oh, it thinks I've got a structure. Uh, all right, never mind. There's a way to do that, but I've top of my head, I forgot what it is. Um, all right, so here's our little guy. We go into here. This is the top of a loop. It's a loop that uses RCX as a counter. It initializes it to eight. It's going to count down. Maybe what we want to do is stop at the top of the loop uh, when we have uh, RCX equal equal one. So we just say if, and there's our new breakpoint, info breakpoint. Sure enough, there it is, uh, 54, 54. Stop only if RCX is one. So let's go ahead and run. And we hit breakpoint five, which is the only breakpoint. And we just assemble and look at that. Right there we are, the top of the loop. RCX is one. So you can have conditions like this uh, to catch things. You can have a range. Your breakpoint can actually be a range of addresses, and you'll, it'll break whenever the instruction pointer is inside that range. That can be helpful. And you can you know, do other kinds of stuff. There are watch points. So I can watch certain things. Let's watch RAX. And when I do a next instruction, you see what happens. It tells me a watch point was hit. Go back up here. Right here, this instruction zeroes out RAX. Just take my word for it. That's going to set RAX to zero. And so we see that, sure enough, the value changed. It went from one to zero. Let's do the next instruction. And you see the right, RAX changed again. It went from zero to 170. Right? So I moved something in here. The next one's going to push a value. It does not modify RAX. So the watch point doesn't report anything. The watch point tells us when a value changes or when an expression changes. So let's go ahead and they show up as breakpoints. So let's go ahead and delete six. Let's delete five while we're at it. And let's go back to that watch. Instead of watching for that, let's watch for when RAX is greater than uh, 10. And let's run. Okay. Start I. We'll break in uh, in uh, here. Copy, paste. Oh, keep doing that. I keep doing that. There. Okay. Now that breakpoint. Um, 
All right, so we can now continue. And uh, we are going to uh, start reporting stuff when the value of Rx changes. When the value of this expression changes, we've never evaluated it before. So as far as GDB is concerned, it has changed. And so it tells us what it is. And it won't report anything further to us because it's not changing any further. All right, so if we continue, it eventually tells us that and terminates. It tells you what the value is at the end. So lots of stuff you can do with that. Again, watch points look like breakpoints. So you can set them, enable them, same way you can breakpoints. Something that might be useful is catching signals. This will catch seg fault. And yes, it has to be uppercase. And you see, sure enough, it shows up in the breakpoint list right there. That's seg seg v. So that would catch our seg fault. Uh, you can catch other stuff too. You can catch system calls, library loads, other kinds of events. You can watch a value change over time. Let's go ahead and delete all these guys. With display. So you want, let's say I wanted to display um, something really useful like the uh, current instruction. Or even better, the three instructions starting at the instruction pointer. Boom, there we go. So let's start I. And you see, it shows me here's where you are. You're right here. Here are the next instructions. If I take a step, look at that. It shows me where I am. Now I'm at the XOR. Now I'm at the move. Now I'm at the pop. This turns out to be really pretty useful if you uh, don't have any other way to display your, your listing. I can modify registers. Right now, my instruction pointer is pointing here at this move. Um, and I just moved the instruction pointer. I just directly modified it to skip over this stuff and let's see what happens. There we go, nothing bad. Uh, so I can modify the instruction pointer. I can even go back and, and do that again and force it to go through this stuff again. My stack's not gonna be right, but that's okay. I can do stuff like um, modify the E flags register. You see it right now, it has the parity flag, the zero flag, and the uh, interrupt flag set. I could turn on a flag. Let's see. There, set E flags. And let's go ahead. I think that's. Yes. Yay, that's a trap flag. The trap flag will be something we'll talk about uh, in a later uh, class. It helps GDB do its work. And I've turned it on because I'm just mean spirited. And I can, of course, uh, also turn it off with an exclusive warp. There you go. Bitwise operators are a big thing. Be sure that you understand the bitwise operators. I can modify memory in the same way. So here's my main function. Um, hmm. Let's go ahead and look at the raw bytes for a moment. And let's see. Um, let's modify something in the program code. Right? The program code itself is unmodifiable, right? It's read only. But let's go ahead and try to make a change. Let's try to change this AA to something else. So that's at C30. C31, C32. So let's go ahead and say set um, So I need to cast main to be a char pointer so I can get to the character there. And I could do that. I could say main plus two. 
But why not just do it that way? Treat main as if it's an array of, of characters, a point of array of characters. And let's see if this will work to set the second one to something else other than AA. Let's set it to, not be too fancy, AB. Wow, look at that. Now it's AB. I've changed the address. That's some craziness. And then when I continue, I hit the breakpoint. Oh, I hit, oh, hit safe fault. Sorry, I hit safe fault. I've been messing with the stack, so who knows what kind of state the thing was in. <laughs> Let's run it again. There we go. And so I did change uh, uh, something. Let's see if, it, if I, the change remains. Boo, it got set back. Let's go ahead and modify it. Uh, so now we're starting. Let's go ahead and change that in main. Continue. And it prints out this result. So instead of printing A, A, it prints A, and then it will want to set B, just like we wanted it to. Yay. OK, so you can modify your program this way, modify memory, all sorts of stuff. This is all well and good, but it's weird to be working at a command line like this. Uh, you can get a sort of a GUI, a, a text mode GUI. We'll talk about other interfaces to GDB later, but uh, we can get there with uh, TUI. So uh, TUI, uh, this doesn't tell you very much about it. <clears throat> it's TUI is the text user interface. And the easiest way to start it is to say layout uh, ASM. This puts it in the assembly layout. And now what you see is the disassembly of your program up here. And then you can enter stuff down here. And instead of the uh, up and down arrows moving you around in here, they move you around up here. So you can scroll around to do your program. If you do want to use the up and down arrows over here, you can change the active view. You see how this is filled in so the, with this teal color. X, uh, control X, O changes the focus to the next thing, and that happens to be down here. So now those work. Control X, O puts it back up there. An even more useful view is layout regs, which tries to display the register values. The program's not running, so they aren't available. Let's start it. And now that it's started, we see that, sure enough, here are the registers up here. Most of them. Control X, O. Now we're looking at the register group. And look at that. I can scroll around in it to see other registers that were hidden. Control X, O. Control X, O. And I'm back to here, and I can scroll around the program. Great. So there's the usual stuff. Again, if I do a step, look at that. It highlights this, and it highlights the registers that changed. So uh, you see from here, RIP has changed, and my interrupt flag is set. I take another step, and I did, an, I did this instruction. And so uh, a few other things have changed. I'm going to modify R9. Maybe. Didn't change, change its value. It stays zero, so it didn't highlight it. I'm pop RSI. That changed, so it gets highlighted. Uh, the stack pointer changed, because I popped something. That gets highlighted. The instruction pointer keeps changing, so that gets highlighted. Uh, I modified RDX in the last instruction, so it gets highlighted. Now I'm going to do this operation with the stack. This is a way of aligning the stack, which we will talk about in the future, but for right now, it's just magic. This alignment is going to and, bitwise and it with all of these with a zero on the end. So that's going to mask off this last guy. And we're going to wind up with the stack pointer being set to zero. So there we go. So, And we can keep walking like this through the program if we want. Uh, if you want to get out of this entirely, TUI disable will take you out as well as control X A, control X A, which will toggle you back and forth. It's entirely possible that things will get messed up while you're doing this. The easiest way for things to get messed up, and you see they just did, right? This is sort of in the wrong place. This is kind of dunked up. 
the easiest way is for your program to generate output because GDB doesn't know about that and it screws up GDB's console formatting. The way to fix that is control L. There you go, just refresh it or refresh and that will refresh the display and, and clean it up. There's some stuff in the lecture notes about how to make that happen automatically. I don't wanna spend a huge amount of time on TUI. I spent a lot of time on GDB. There's some ways to script GDB that are in the lecture notes that I think are kind of neat. Uh, but let's say that I have a binary that's been stripped. So our binary before this had a lot of symbols in it. We can look at them with dash T. It had main and, and uh, right whatever, it had these symbols in it. Now look at this, after running strip, there are no symbols in our binary. And often when you get malware or even system uh, level stuff, it's been stripped just to save space or compress it or because you don't want people to see your symbols or for any number of reasons. And when you try to work with a file that's been stripped, weird things happen. First, there's no main. So it can't do that. Um, I can't disassemble start either. It's completely confused. So let's go ahead and do a start I. And notice it tells you who I am, but it has no idea what's going on there. It doesn't know what it should interpret this as. If I tell it to disassemble at my current location, it says no function contains a program counter for the selected frame. Lots of stuff is just broken now because GDB can't find a function to disassemble for me. That's okay because if you remember, I have a bunch of, uh, of tricks that can help me out. Let's display the three instructions starting our IP. And so now I can walk through the program and I can see some disassembly and uh, that's great. I can set start to be that location in case I want to look at it later. Here we go. Um, I can set breakpoints based on that variable. So I can set variables and do other stuff like this as I'm analyzing a program that doesn't have debugging symbols. Here we go. Here's a bunch of stuff. Uh, this is interesting. Let's go ahead and grab this address. Let's look at the, let's try to disassemble that address and it's gonna tell me I can't do it. So again, we can fall back on other tricks like that. And now I can look at the disassembly at that location. Oh, look, this appears to be uh, the startup code for, for running the C system, the C runtime. All right, so there we go. Uh, oftentimes you'll have to use these kind of tricks to debug programs that are actively hostile to being debugged, the way things are. But the bytes are still there. And you can explicitly tell the system to debug them. It's just not going to be as easy as it normally is. All right, let's pop out of that. And let's go back to here. We've covered all this stuff. So I'm just going to page through it. Uh, each slide, by the way, uh, talks about something. The red line is here to show this is the old stuff. The new stuff is down here as I walk through it in GDB. Only thing more fun than watching someone type at a prompt is watching slides where someone has typed at a prompt. It's just all kinds of fun. All right. You can count on GDB being installed on Linux, so it's a pretty good idea to know the basics. It's installed on many other platforms as well. You can even install it on Windows and debug on Windows. Perfectly good debugger. Great. Let's talk about some instruction set topics. 
So everything on the machine pretty much is done by convention. The machine gives you very, very, very basic tools, right? It gives you some lumber and some nails and a hammer, and it says, build a house. And it's up to you to know that there's a, there are standards for that, right? It's like, should I, how far apart should I put the studs in the wall? Is it 16 inches? Can it be 24 inches? What's the right number? I need to put those down and, and figure that out. And that's a convention. And if you don't put them at 16 inch intervals, no one's gonna come and arrest you, right? They're just not gonna be at 16 inch intervals. And then when someone's trying to hang something, they're gonna expect the stud to be where it's not. All right, fine. So the same thing is true here, right? There are conventions and I can often violate those conventions if I want. And one of them is how you represent numbers. So, uh, Here's 678. We write it in the uh, in the Hindu Arabic numeral system. Weirdly, we write it from right to left because that's that's how they work. Uh, you may have never thought about the fact that numbers work in this other direction, but that's kind of how they work. And we're used to reading them left to right, 678, but uh, but really they're they're sort of set up to work the other way. That's fine. It's not important. So. Here we have the highest order digit, the six for 600. Here we have the lowest order digit, the eight for just eight. And we can write our binary numbers the same way, right? We can write them, write them like this, sort of left to right, if you will, if you wanna think of it that way, with the highest order one here and the lowest order one here, and that'll work just fine. And we write them in base two, okay? Using zero and one, simple, simple stuff, just a different way of writing the same number. Doesn't have to be that way. In fact, if you look straight across, you'll see this perverse looking thing. This is the same number as this. Well, sort of. Uh, this is a way of representing this 678 in binary, but doing it in a way where each nibble is one digit. So each nibble ranges from zero up to nine, and then I would use the next nibble. This is called packed binary coded decimal and you don't care about it. And if you are writing or working with embedded code for a boat, you may care. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, you're not gonna care, right? Often things get coded this way before they're displayed, like on an LCD display on some little embedded systems. But for the most part, you don't care. This is just a way of avoiding having to do lots of conversion math to display a decimal value. You just read the decimal value straight out. All right, that's not that important. Um, but it's just a different way. Shows there's different different conventions for doing it, and there are rules for doing math on it. Computers, uh, even up into the 80s, had specialized arithmetic logic units that would do math using numbers coded in this way. One of the machines that has specialized logic to do math with numbers that are in packed BCD is the x86. <laughs> but it, it doesn't matter. You can still pretty much ignore it. Uh, so we typically, we want to represent this. We'll split it into two bytes. And that looks like this. There's a byte that holds the high order bits, the value two, and the byte that holds the low order bits, uh, whatever's left over, All right? This is two. And it's uh, 256, so it's 500. This is, uh, this represents 512, basically. 512 is uh, 166. So this would be, uh, or, uh, sorry, um, yeah, 166. This would be 166. So there you go. Two and 166 representing 678. All right. And that's the usual way we do it. There's a high byte and a low byte. And then the question becomes, where do we put them? So suppose we wanna write this value out of a register where we don't care about ordering and that kind of stuff and into memory. We need two bytes. So let's say we use byte at location A and one at location A plus one. Which one do I put at A? I could put the high byte or I could put the low byte. Hmm. Uh, if I put the low byte, this one at A, and the high byte here, then the little end comes first. And I call that little Indian. And that's what I end up with. 
It sort of looks backwards when you look at memory. If I want the high byte to come first, followed by the low byte, that's big Indian. Okay, where the big end comes first. And this looks normal to us because we normally write our digits left to right with the big end first. And when we look at memory, we look at it left to right, and we'll see that the little end is first. It looks like the numbers have been reversed, but it's just a different, just a way of storing it. Uh, ARM is little, uh, ARM is by Indian. There's actually a way you can switch it. If you're looking at ARM code, it's almost certainly going to be little Indian, unless the hardware you're using makes it more convenient to use big Indian. The x86 is a little Indian processor. The 6800 family and the 68000 family are big Indian processors. And it goes back and forth. Most of them today are little Indian. There's, there are slight advantages to being little Indian in some cases and slight advantages to being big Indian in some cases. Uh, it's really arbitrary, but little Indian seems to be the way that they mostly get represented. So uh, I'll mention this, this is an aside. It's, I think it's just a fun fact. When you send a multi-byte number over a network connection, right, you wanna send those two bytes what order do you send them? It matters, right? It matters if you're sending the little end first or the big end first. And in network byte order, we send them big end first. Suppose you're sending 678, the digits. You would send the six and the seven and the eight, right? That's the order you'd be reading them left to right. And so that would mean you were sending the highest order decimal digit first. You're sending the big end of the number first. And so we just say, okay, that's how we're going to do everything. And so uh, network by order is considered big Indian, right? It's not, we're not storing things in memory. So it's not like it's truly big Indian, but we tend to think of it that way. That's a network by order. And that's maybe the only time you have to think about big Indian. Otherwise your world is going to be mostly little Indian. Uh, so if you want to store this big number in memory, we can take this decimal number, convert it to hex, and it looks like this. And so we know that every two hex digits is one byte. So that's one, two, three, four bytes. So we can write it this way to see those four bytes. Uh, this is the most significant byte, and this is the least significant byte, the little end of it. And this is the big end. We can store this as a four byte in a four byte register or in four bytes of memory. In a 64 bit register, we have this. We'd have eight bytes, zeros in front here, and then the four bytes of the number here. Then we want to write it to memory. We uh, we have to think about the big end, which is really here. This is not anything. I'm going to put in the wrong place. Big end is right here. Little end is right here. So in registers, we don't care about Indianness. Registers are just registers, but in memory, we absolutely do. So suppose we want to store this at location 18. So if I tell the system write this number to location 18, it will do this. It'll take the little end of it, which is 28, and put it at 18. The next higher order byte, it'll put it 19. The next one here, so on. It basically looks to us like it's reversed it. In reality, it hasn't, right? This is just a number in a register, and this is how it gets written into memory. That's it. Simple, simple stuff. It just looks backwards to us because we're used to reading them left to right. And now they're stored. If we look at memory as increasing to the right, they look backward. Again, it's just the way of looking at it. Uh, it'll show up a lot in, in listings and hex dumps. You have to get used to looking at this stuff. Here's our big fancy number again. We store it in RAX. We'll talk about strict later on today. So don't, don't panic yet. Uh, this is just a way of preventing the assembler from optimizing this instruction, right? Assemblers optimize. I don't want this instruction optimized. And so the assembler doesn't optimize it. It puts it out right here. And you see there are the bytes again in reverse order, right? They're the leading zeros, then the 98, 4B, 71, 28, right there. So the bytes got written out in reverse order. Something interesting uh, to do might be to go and look at how it looks in the file itself. So we can go to object dump and look at the file header. And we'll see this. 
What does all this mean? This means that there's a text section at file offset 180 in hex, and it's 10 bytes in length, right? A is 10. And so I can use XXD to look at those bytes. And there it is again. There's our number. Just it's been reversed. It's in little Indian form. That was a lot of work. It turns out there's an easier way to do it, which is to just tell Objump to do a dash S, give it a specific, in this, in this case, a specific section, and it dumps that out. And there's our number in little Indian format again. All right, beating this into the ground. Something that you may have noticed before, maybe, maybe you noticed it, was this weird looking move ABS. Where did that come from? I didn't say move ABS up here. I said move. And then it made it move ABS. Is it the strict thing that caused it? No, nothing to do with that. Although that does cause it to emit this. It's not, it doesn't actually make this move ABS. You can go look in the Intel documentation. Here is the Intel link to the Intel documentation. You can search all of the different mnemonics that are available on Intel, and you will not find this because it is not one. What is this? This is a bit of the AT&T syntax leaking into here. There's a library used by Objump uh, and a lot of other uh, GNU utilities called the Binary File Descriptor Library, BFD. It contains some disassembly code and it likes to write uh, these 64-bit these, uh, uh, literal moves as move ABS. It just does. That's how it writes them out. You can't, you can't assemble that, <laughs> but it can show you that. And the world's different, right? If I go and look at the, uh, use the online disassembler, which we'll cover later on in another class, the online disassembler is really cool. I can load some code up to that. And it, sure enough, look at that, move ABS. That's a hint that it's using uh, the BFD library. If I take that same code and I dump it in Ghidra, we'll talk about Ghidra later on. Look at that, no move ABS, just plain old move like you would expect. So again, just another, yeah, anything that anyone can do to make life harder in assembly, somebody has taken the time to implement that for you. So just be aware of that. All right, let's come out of that and let's talk a little bit about something I mentioned earlier, which is two's complement. So one's complement. You do not care about one's complement. The only reason to even mention it is because any discussion of two's complement is required by some kind of law to mention one's complement. Uh, I want to negate a number. Let's say my number is 87. One way to negate it is to flip all the bits. Flipping all the bits is a fancy way of saying, I'm going to subtract each bit from one. So one minus one is zero. So now here I'm doing this, doing the subtraction. I right? hear all my ones, I subtract one from one and get zero. One minus one is zero, one minus one is zero, one minus zero is one. I do that and you see what I've done? I've flipped all the bits. If you look here and you look here, the bits are flipped. Uh, that gives me this value, which happens to be 168. So that's negative 87 in a one's complement 8-bit world. The problem with this is here at the end. If I take zero and I flip all the bits, I get all ones. And that's another, that's negative zero. That's a way, that's two ways of representing zero. That's a problem. Why is that a problem? That's a problem for doing math. Right? When I try to do some operation that crosses around zero, I don't get the right value, right? Because there's a, there are actually two zeros. And so I'd have to subtract, let's say, one more when I cross zero to avoid that extra zero. That's really annoying. No one likes it. It makes math complicated. Since mathematicians basically create new computers, they're not going to like it. There you go. That's one's compliment. You can now erase your brain from that. No, I'm not going to ask any questions about it. I don't care about it. Two's complement is what you want to know. Uh, and in this, instead of complementing by subtracting each bit from one, I basically subtract each bit from two. That's why it's two's complement. So if I wanted to complement a single bit, I would subtract it from two. Two in binary is one zero. 
So I would, uh, you know, complement a one by subtracting it from two, that would give me one. Uh, complement a zero by subtracting it from two, that would give me, uh, that would leave it at two and give me a zero. So there's, there's ways to do that. What does that look like for a larger number? All right? I subtract it from this, All right? So instead of being a field of ones, it's essentially a field of twos, which causes me to push that one all the way over here and wind up in this highest position. Okay, so for a, an eight bit number, I'd have the one in this ninth position. And then I subtract zero minus one. What is that? I've got to borrow. So I go here. It's also zero. I got to borrow. So I go here and then here and then here and then here and here and here. And I borrow this one. That becomes 10 in binary, which is two. Uh, right. And then I start to, I can finally work my way back. I'll borrow one from that to move here, borrow one from that to move here and so on and so on and so on and so on. And that finally comes here. That's 10 minus one is one or two minus one is one. Uh, that's going to be left as one, one minus one is zero. And then I, I go along the way here. So there you go. And that's how I would negate it. The nice thing about this is I only have one representation for zero, right? Think about all zeros here and I subtract. It's fine. I just get zeros, which is the same thing I have when I started and I'm done. All right. The trick to all of this, and this is a trick that the math people love, is that for a lot of things, it doesn't matter whether the number is considered signed or unsigned. A lot of things will work just fine. Like there's an ad. Are EAX and EBX signed or unsigned? It doesn't matter. I just have to remember what I intend, right? If I intend them to be signed, the result of this will be the correct signed value. If I intend them to be unsigned, the result of this will be the correct unsigned value. That's really cool. Okay. So adding and subtracting work the way you'd expect. So here's the thing that broke last time. We didn't go in depth into it because I didn't care that much, but now we might care, right? Three plus negative two. So here's three in the eight bit two's complement world, right? Two plus one is three. Over here, we have the, we, we compute the negation of two, right? Two is right here. That's, that's two in eight bit binary. We subtract it from this guy and that gives us this value right here. And notice that this bit is set. So the result is in fact negative, right? This is negative two. So then I wanted to add those two values, three plus negative two. When I add them, right? Zero plus one is one. One plus one is two, which is 10 in binary. So I put the zero here and I carry the one. One plus one is two. Again, carry the one. I keep carrying the one and writing down zeros all the way over here till I overflow and throw that carry away. And I wind up with this result. And the result is one. And yes, three plus negative two is one, right? Three minus two is one. Nothing super complicated here. It's just neat that it works this way. So two's complement is the thing. If you wanted to think of one's complement as flipping all the bits, you can think of two's complement as flipping all the bits and then adding one. I don't want to think about that way because it hurts my brain. Okay. It's still a trade-off. Uh, you wind up with one more negative number than you have positive numbers. That may seem a little weird, but it's, it's true. Uh, so let's say I have negative 128 and I'm in an eight bit twos complement world. How do I, I want to negate that to figure out what the representation of 128 should be. So I take that, this is, there's a negative. This is what 128 positive looks like in 8-bit two's complement. Uh, you'll notice that the sign bit is set. That's a bad sign, but that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll make it through. I want to uh, flip the bits and add one. I do that, I get, look at this. I get the same thing. Flipping the bits and adding one gives me the same result. And so I'm right back here at negative 128. Oh, that's painful. So that means there is a number that if I negate it, I get the same value back. 
you can try this. Go and get yourself a uh, an int. Take the maximum negative value for that int. Put a minus sign in front of it and see and see what you get. <laughs> so uh, that's how two's complement numbers work. Uh, and in fact, it's it uh, can be a vulnerability in programs that aren't properly checking things. Sometimes, if you get right up near the right up at the highest uh, if you cause computation to get to the highest uh, value, subsequent math will break because of that, because that one value is magic. And uh, if you don't trigger an overflow that gets caught, you can sometimes cause programs to behave uh, in erratic ways and break security. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that's a thing. Signed and unsigned. So uh, nothing about a register itself marks it as either signed or unsigned. It's just a bag of bits, OK? It's up to you, the programmer, to remember whether you intend its content to be signed or unsigned. And while it may not matter for adding and subtracting, it does matter for a lot of other things. So on the x86, there's an add and a sub instruction, and those are for both signed and unsigned addition and subtraction. Doesn't matter, as we just showed. But sign matters for multiplication and division, OK? And so there are instructions for unsigned multiplication and division, mul and div. And there are different and different in strange ways Instructions for imul and idiv, which are signed multiply and divide, right? If there's an opportunity for the x86 to break symmetry in a way that is confusing to the programmer, they have done it, okay? Just assume that's the case. There are logical shifts. Now, clearly, when I shift something, I want to move all the bits, right? But what if I have a sign bit? If I move the sign bit over, I might not get the right answer. So maybe I want to take negative four and I might be able to use shifts to divide it by two and get negative two. That implies that I have to leave the sign bit set. I have to leave it alone and shift all the other bits. Well, we have special uh, shifts called the arithmetic shifts. So arithmetic shift left and arithmetic shift right, shift all of the bits except our sign bit. All right, important stuff to know if you care about that kind of thing. There's a compare instruction. We can use it for comparing signed and unsigned numbers. How does it work? I tell you here, but we'll cover it in more detail later. Don't worry about it. It matters when interpreting the results of a comparison for conditional jumps. We're going to spend some time talking about conditional jumps, so I'm going to skip this. These links, by the way, take you to uh, documentation on those instructions. So if you wanted to, to find out what's going on with that, you can go to the documentation. All right, let's talk about conditional branches. The stuff, the material I just skipped on the last slide, we're going to go in more depth into right here. So when I compare two things with CMP, like when I say, when I say CMP, RAX, and 17, I want to compare RAX to 17. How do I do that? Well, the way I do it is I subtract 17 from RAX. I compute the difference. I don't modify RAX. I don't modify any registers. I just compute the difference, and then I set the flags based on that. So the compare does a subtraction and then sets flags. And the flags it sets are these. This first one, you don't care about. It's used for PECT, binary, coded, decimal, the thing we mentioned before. And it's almost inaccessible in the 64-bit version of the processor. If you go back to the 32-bit, you can do stuff with it. In the 64-bit world, they've made it almost impossible to get to. Okay, So you don't care about it. It's grayed out. Pretend it's not there. Uh, it's kind of kind of funny because the confusing way in which it sets it can actually lead to some some fancy high speed uh, approximate approximate math in certain circumstances. Uh, you just can't do that on the 64-bit machines. So don't worry about it. 
You probably don't need to. These four bit machines are fast. All right, so there's a carry flag. What is the carry flag? Well, you know when you add numbers and you have a carry? That's what it is. Uh, when you subtract numbers and you have a borrow, that's what it is. This tells me if there was a carry past the last position or a borrow from the last position, okay? And in this case, if we're doing a compare, it would be subtraction, and that would mean I'm going to set it if the entire subtraction required a borrow in the last position. So when I compare 21 and 31, so let's say I put 21 in the register and I compare that register to 31. That will then subtract 31 from the contents of the register, which is 21. This is bigger than this. So I've got a borrow in that last position and that will set the carry flag. If I try the compare of 21 and 17, this is smaller. I can just do that subtraction without having to borrow from the last position and the carry flag is clear. <clears throat> That's it. That's all, that's all there is to it. Carry is used for other things, as you know, from shifts and that kind of stuff. But essentially, it just tells me uh, if I needed a carry or a borrow. And in the compare version, it tells me if I needed a borrow. So this is how I figure out if one unsigned number is larger than another unsigned number, right? Carry was set here and clear here. So you can already begin to see how I might figure out greater than or less than. The overflow flag. This is set if the most significant bit, which is the sign bit for a sign number, changes. Okay. Now think about that. The sign bit for the result will be different from the sign bit for the first number if a couple of different things happen, right? The overflow flag will get set if Let's say I'm counting up and my count uh, gets so large that it, it changes the, uh, the sign bit. Then I've overflowed the sign version of the number and I need to know, and that's why it's called the overflow flag. It also gets set if I cross zero. So here's an example of that. If I compare minus two and minus three, I'm gonna compute the difference. That's minus two minus minus three, which is minus two plus three, which is one. Ah, this is negative. The sign bit is set, right? There's a one in the highest position. This is positive. The sign bit is clear. There's a zero in the highest position. The overflow flag gets set. All right, that's the overflow flag. If that's confusing to you, don't think about it too hard. Uh, this is probably more than you'll ever need to know about it. There is a parity flag. This is set if the number of ones in the least significant byte of the result is even. Why do I care about parity? I care about parity for a lot of odd things. One of them being uh, error uh, containment, error reduction, uh, transmitting bytes around the world. Uh, parity is a good simple way to check results. It turns out that it also has some interesting mathematical properties that we can exploit. If we knew the parity of the whole number, we don't. We just know the parity of the least significant byte, so it's less helpful than it could be, but that's okay. Uh, the sign flag shouldn't be complicated. The sign flag is set if the result of the subtraction is negative in the two's complement sense, right? Is the sign bit of the result set? Then the sign flag is set. Is it clear? Then the sign flag is clear. So when I compare 21 and 24, I subtract hex 24 from hex 21. This is bigger than this. So the result will be negative and the sign flag will be set. All right. So we can think for a few moments and think I'm comparing two, let's say two unsigned numbers. I know if the carry flag is set that this one was larger than this one. And if it's clear, I know that they were smaller or equal. Can I distinguish the or equal case? Yes, I can. I can do that by checking the zero flag. The zero flag is set if the two operands are equal and the subtraction results in zero. All right, that was a lot to throw at you. Can I summarize that in a way that looks even more intimidating? Yes, I can. Here it is. These are 
all of the conditional branch mnemonics on the 64-bit platform. You should be happy because there's such a small number, I can put them on one slide. There are a lot of them, but I'm gonna make them smaller in just a moment. Uh, and so if you're wondering what JECXZ is, uh, that looks at the register ECX to see if it's zero. If you're wondering what uh, J and BE is, it's jump if not below or equal, okay? And I also tell you how to test these things, right? So jump if not below, we look at see if carry flag is zero. For jump greater than, we look to see if the zero flag is zero, so they're not equal. And the sign flag matches the overflow flag, which is a way of checking to see if they're greater for a signed number. If you think hard about that one, don't think too hard about it, just, just trust it. This is a one way of looking at them. It gives you all the words, but there is, a, I think, a better way of looking at them. And so the way I like to structure them is like this. All right, still not totally unintimidating, but maybe a little more reasonable. If you wanna know whether you're above or below, and that works for unsigned numbers, this is the stuff you want. If you wanna know if you're greater than or less than, that works for signed numbers, here's what you want. If you wanna know about equality or about some of the flags, here's what you want, right? This is the one that checks equality. These little tables are set up so that in a column here, I have synonyms. Okay, these are synonyms. Jump if above and jump if not below or equal, those are synonyms. Those are two different mnemonics, but they really represent the same thing, right? The same thing. Jump if above, jump if not below or equal. So these are synonyms here. Sometimes there's, there's just a pair. Sometimes there are several. The rows represent anonyms. So jump, the opposite of jump if above is jump if not above. The opposite of jump if below or equal is jump if not below or equal. Okay, so that's how they're, they're set up. Now, since these are synonyms, there's really just one thing here, jump if above. And there's really just one thing here. All right, jump if not above. So really there are just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 actual branch conditions you can test. And the ones with the asterisks by them are the preferred synonyms for obj dump. What do I mean by that? Let's pop back down here. And I think I have a little file called jumps.asm. And look at this. I have jump if above, jump if not below or equal. Jump if not above, jump if below or equal. So each of these little blocks is the, are the synonyms for it. And all of the different ones are in here, except the ones that deal with RCX. I'll talk about those in a minute. So suppose I assemble that. And what do you think I'm gonna see when I take a look at this? And the answer is, look at that, jump above, jump above. Look at that, jump below three times. These synonyms are recognized by the assembler, but they all assemble to the same hexadecimal bytes or the same bytes, I shouldn't say exactly, the same bytes. Uh, so there's no way to know after assembly, which one of these I originally said. Did I say jump if, if carry, or did I say jump if below? Well, if I said jump if carry, and then when later on when I look at the disassembly of my code, I won't see jump if carry, I'll see jump if below. If I say jump if the carry is clear, JCC on most platforms, but JNC on the x86, I would instead see JAE because that's the preferred synonym for obj dump. And the preferred synonyms are not the same everywhere. 
prefer object dump, these are what you'll see. They're slightly different for some other disassemblers, just the way they are. Now it's worth mentioning, so this is all just in with flags. Down at the bottom, you may see a little table that deals with the count register. The count register is special. Remember the count register is RCX. If I, there's actually an instruction that tells me to jump if RCX contains the value zero, JRCX zero. I can look at the first 32 bits of it, that's ECX, and jump if that's zero. I can look at the first 16 bits of it, that's CX, and jump if that's zero. You don't see those very often. They do come up in some obscure code, but they're pretty rare. All right, 19 actual branches. If it seems super complicated, take a deep breath, relax. Remember, above and below are for unsigned numbers, greater than or less than are for signed numbers, and then there's equality. These guys down here deal with the overflow, sign, and parity flags, and you probably won't care about them very much. Uh, right, you're just not going to care about these. You're probably not going to care about this. You're probably only going to mostly care about jump above, jump below, jump greater than or equal to, uh, jump greater than, jump equal, or jump zero. Those are the ones you're going you're gonna to care about, these little five tables right here. Okay. All right. Memory references in the x86 are pretty powerful things. They work very similar to the way memory references work in C. That's not a coincidence. We want the C language to be compiled into stuff that runs fast. And so we want, it's nice if there's not a, a big impedance mismatch between the way we represent things in C and the way they're represented on the processor. And so they're going to work very similarly. So suppose I have an array of ints. Those are four bytes wide. And let's say here's my array R, my little pirate array of, of ints, four bytes. So the zeroth one is here. The First one is here, second one, and so on. And R4 is right here. It's the fifth entry in the array. So how do I get that address? Well, I take the base of the array, and I add the index of the element I want times the size of each element. So that's array plus 4 times 4. Easy stuff that you all learned in C. Nothing complicated uh, here. I have three things going on. I have the base of the array. I have the scale of an item, which in this case is four. And I have the index of the item, which is also four. So how do we get to this byte right here? It's the second byte, or byte one, of the seventh, of element seven, or the eighth element. Everything is zero base, so it's weird. Well, to get there, I take the base, I add the uh, index of 7 times the scale of 4, that's 28, so it's array plus 28, that gets me to this byte, and then I have a displacement of one additional byte. And I can represent that in C just like this. I take my array, I cast it to a byte pointer so that my array math is going to work correctly, I add 7 times the size of an int, and then I add one as a displacement, and that gets me the address of this specific byte. Pretty simple stuff. That gets represented in the Intel syntax this way. So over here, I have my base, my index, my scale, and a displacement. And that's what a memory address looks like. So I construct one in the x86 world. Base and index, scale and displacement. The base is given by a register, one of the general purpose registers. If I don't specify a base, it's zero. Okay. 
the index is given by another register, right? Typically, I'll want the base to be some changing address, so I need to put that in a, in a register. Index will be some changing index into the array, so I'll put that in, in, in a register as well. It's zero by default, two. Okay, so if it's not there, then it's assumed to be zero. The scale has to be one, which is the default, or two, or four, or eight. Those are the only values it can be. <clears throat> so if I don't have the index in here, that's zero times anything is zero, so I can just drop this whole term. And the displacement is a literal. Okay, so remember I had the array base R, that's given by a, a register. You can think of it as a variable. Index is the uh, index into it given by a variable. Scale is one, two, four, or eight. That's just the way it is. And then I added one. So this is a literal over here that I would add. In case you don't remember what the general purpose registers are, they are right down here. Those are your general purpose registers. Notice that the stack pointer is one. So I can refer to things on the stack by just dropping the stack pointer right in here. <laughs> and that will work fine. This, by the way, is a signed displacement. Okay, so this could be negative. This is an aside. Some people care about this. Some people don't. When I covered this in previous classes, some people will bring this up. So I'll bring it up right now and dismiss it. There is, uh, so scale index base is encoded in something called the sib byte. And in reality, it's no longer just one byte. In the 64-bit world, I need more than one, than one byte to encode it for obvious reasons. Uh, a byte is eight bits. I need two bits to encode the scale, right? Because it's one, two, four, eight. That's four different values. I need two bits for that. I need to have two registers. In a world where I have very few registers, I can probably use three bits to determine each register. But in a world where I have all of these registers down here at the bottom, I need four bits for each one. So four, four, two, that's more than eight already. Okay. Displacement is usually a literal that comes after the, uh, after the instruction. All right, so SIB typically encodes this stuff. But if you care, I guess you care. If you don't care, you don't care. Uh, there's another byte called the mod RM that comes into play as well. If you care about these, read about them. They are pretty much only useful to you if you are building an assembler, building a disassembler, or have some other weird reason to want to know how instructions are encoded. Otherwise, ignore them. Out of scope. So let's look at some examples of memory references. Let me call these things in brackets effective addresses. There's a weird, obscure reason for that. Don't worry about it. If you see effective address, just think address. So 1028. This gives me only the displacement. Everything else is zero. So zeros plus 1028 is 1028. The effective address of this is 1028. Nothing complicated here. The base only. This says whatever value, whatever 64-bit value is in RAX, that's your address. Base and displacement. So take this address, add this number to it. That's your address. This kind of addressing may seem weird, but it's going to show up an awful lot when we get to RIP relative addressing. Base and index. What's my scale factor? It's one. Which one of these is the index and which one is the base? Who knows? Doesn't matter. No one cares, right? The assembler is going to do something. I don't know what it's going to do. Try it out. Um, it's going to do something. It uh, doesn't matter which one. We just basically add these two registers together and we're done. Scale and index. Take what's in RAX, multiply it by two. That's your address. Add, multiply it by four and add two. That's your address. 
And then all the pieces, here's the base, here's your, uh, your index, here's your scale factor, there are quad words. And then we add two to get to the third byte of the ninth quad word in the array pointed to by RDX. Oh, sorry, I didn't say ninth. I should say the RX quad word in the array pointed to by RDX. All right. This is the Intel syntax. Here's a provisos, okay? The Intel syntax, AT&T syntax is different. And the order of the parts in this does not matter. Does not matter. Uh, NASM is smart enough that if you put the two over here and you put the RDX over here, it'll figure it out. Okay, it'll we'll just figure it out. In fact, NASM is smart enough that if I did something like say four divided by two over here, it would figure that out too. Okay. Uh, it'll do a little bit of math for you as long as it results in a constant at assemble time, you're good. So you could use macros or other things uh, if you wanted. Okay. This is this arithmetic is super useful. Do you remember way catch your mind way back to when we were talking about the hailstone numbers and the coats conjecture? Even numbers you divide by two. Odd numbers you multiply by three and add one. And we had to write code to multiply our number by three and add one. Well, look at this. Suppose our number is an RAX. What is this address? This is a memory address, right? So I took the contents of RAX, I multiply it by two, I add RAX to it. So RAX times two plus RAX is three times RAX. And then I add one. So this is three times RAX plus one. If RAX holds n, this is three n plus one. This computes the same value, but it computes it as an address. So that would, it would be great if I could just get this value without having to do anything with that address. Wouldn't that be, that would be nice? I don't want to do anything with the address. I just want to know what the value is. There's an instruction for that. It's probably the second most used instruction in x86 assembly. You will see it all over the place doing weird stuff. And it is LEA, load effective address. Okay. It takes two operands. It takes one of these things, an address reference. And then it takes a register to set. It doesn't dereference this. This is not going to get a value from this address. This just straight up computes 3n plus 1 and puts it in RAX. It's pretty nifty. If I can break a complicated computation down into a series of these, I will like doing that. In fact, your compiler will do that. You should, you should give that a try and see what your compiler makes of it. When you turn optimization on, it'll try hard to figure out how to use LEA to do this because this is fast. It's very fast. We're not accessing memory, which would slow us down. We're just computing an address and the x86 has specialized hardware to do all of this in one cycle. That's pretty cool. So this is fast. We like doing this. Okay. Notice that I use R here, R-A-X. In our original program, we had E-A-X holding the value because it was an int. Well, addresses have to be 64 bits. So I always want to be sure when I have an address reference, I use the R version here. There are, in fact, ways you can get away with other stuff. Don't, don't try to play that game. Just be sure you always use R's in your address. Uh, weird things will happen. Mainly the, mainly the assembler will complain. So let's put that in our program. Here's the call ats conjecture program that we wrote to figure out the stopping time for 27 in hex, or that in this case, sorry, in decimal. Uh, the stopping time for 27. And we had two cases. We had an even case, which we optimized last time to be shifting right by one in order to divide by two. And we had an odd case where we multiply by three and add one. And now we look at this, we can use load effective address. We're replacing all that code with, with multiplying and setting registers and all that. That's all gone. 
and now we just straight up do this in, you know, it's, this is a super fast instruction and we're done. So this is a big optimization. Reducing the number of instructions will make your program run faster normally in most cases for obvious reasons. Re replacing an instruction with a shorter instruction can also make your program run faster, especially when it's in a loop. And the reason is a shorter instruction means that I can fill my pipelines more, okay? Because they're shorter. All right, enough rambling over that stuff. A long instruction means I throw away a lot of partially evaluated pipelines. A short instruction means I throw away fewer partially evaluated pipelines and preserve them. If you're deep into optimizing code, I don't know what your life has gone wrong, but but uh, you may want to reevaluate your life choices. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> so short instructions run faster, fewer instructions run faster in general. So there are cases where when I'm doing something with memory, I have to tell the assembler what I'm working with, okay? Let's say that I'm down here and I just do this. Move the value 17 into this location in memory. So what this is gonna do is move, it's going to take the value 17 and it's going to try to store it at the address pointed to by RAX, right? Okay, this is gonna compute an address and this is going to move 17 into the memory at that address. I guess I will tell you what effective means because I, it's bothering me. Uh, there are a couple different kinds of addresses in the system. There are physical addresses, which are actual addresses interpreted by the memory controller uh, that talks to the DRAM. And there are effective addresses, which are the addresses that are used by the paging system. Uh, this is an effective address. Your program will pretty much only deal with effective addresses. Virtual addresses is what we'll typically say because they're virtual, just what it is. All right, so 17 will go into memory here. And, but what does that mean? Is this 17 a single byte? And I just store one byte at this address? Is it meant to be a two byte version of 17, a four byte, an eight byte? Is it meant to be what? What is this supposed to be? I don't know how to do this. If you try to assemble this instruction, the assembler will not take it. It will say, I don't know how big this is. Yeah, it'll fit in the byte, but did you mean to be a, a double word version of this? So what you have to do is specify it. And you can specify either the size of the thing that you're storing or reading or the size of the target memory. And sometimes you'll see PTR in here for pointer. That's fine. It, for, the, for NASM, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I could say, I want to put the value 17 into the double word pointed to by RAX. Or I could say, I want to put the double word 17 into memory at location RAX. Either one of those will result in a 32-bit version of 17. Looks like that. No, it does not look like that. That is not right. Ignore that terrible wrong binary. It's three. <laughs> it's three. Um, in fact, that's, that's, that's so wrong. It's, it hurts my brain to look at it. I don't know how this got in here. Uh, and the main point of view about RAX. That's, that's terrible, right? What should it be? It should be uh, one, should be set. And then two, four, eight, 16 should be set be here and here and it should be 32 bits this is just eight that's that's i don't know how this got in here i must have been having a stroke when i made this slide all right so here they are some here's some intel syntax examples of this i could walk through all of these but i don't want to <laughs> all right i'll go through a couple of them here look at this we're comparing ebx which is a double word to the contents of memory at this location this is redundant I don't need this because I already know it's a double word because that's how big this register is. But I can put it in here and it's fine. These are just put in here to make it explicit. Here I'm loading this address into this register. So notice the ones up above here, 
I'm dereferencing effectively, right? You can think of this as using a star in C. Down here, I'm just talking about the address. Okay, and this tells you exactly what it is based on what's in these registers. And you can walk through those. Be sure you understand all of those and life is good. LE, by the way, is Little Indian. All right. Whew. Let's talk about register aliases again. I think we've mentioned this before, but now let's dig into it a little more. If I have a 64-bit register, like RAX, uh, it consists of eight bytes. And here they are. The low four bytes are addressable as EAX. The lowest two bytes are addressable as AX. Uh, and I can actually address either one of those two. This is AH and this is AL. Back in the 16-bit world, I had these. This little quadrant right here, where I had four general purpose registers, the accumulator and so on. And I could address the low bytes of them. And I also had source destination, base pointer, and stack pointer. So I had this column right here. That's all I had. I couldn't address the individual bytes of these guys. That's fine. When I went to the 32-bit world, I added this column right here, the 32-bit column. And then I had these three columns on the right. In the 64-bit world, I added these R versions of the registers. But in addition, I added these. So now I can address the lowest byte of each of these. And you'll notice it has its own standard, SIL for low byte, DIL, BPL, and SPL. There's probably no reason to ever want to know what the lowest byte of the stack pointer is, right? The stack pointer is RSP. This is not the stack pointer. This is not, this is not having these around. I guess that makes it nice and, and symmetric, but you really should avoid using these. Okay. Now in the 64-bit world, I added these registers. It would be nice if I could do the same thing with them. And in fact, I can. And instead of following this standard or this standard or any standard that existed, they invent a new standard. So instead of R8 and E8, I have R8 and R8 double word, R8 word, R8 byte. So this is the low 32 bits, the low 16 bits, and the low 8 bit of each of these registers. 128-bit registers. 256-bit registers, which are the YMM registers, and then 512-bit registers, which are the AVR512 registers. And these registers, these wide registers, are mainly used to hold an array of other smaller values and then operate in an, in an array fashion. We'll talk about them in a later class. Uh, is this all the registers? You want to guess? It's the x86. The answer is, of course, it's not. Who knows how many there are? No one knows. And it varies all over the place. And so I recommend this blog post uh, to take a look at this because it's kind of hilarious. No time to go into that. Uh, I don't really have time to get into zero extend and sign extend because that takes some explanation. So we will pick up here next time.